I'll just I will just share my screen. Right. Thank you very much. Terrific. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks for the opportunity to have a have a talk about this very important uh, topic about our future of our cultural memory and such things. Um, the first thing about I should say about me is I'm not an archivist. Okay. Um, I've been working in the cultural sector, as Matt said, in in a trans Tasman sense for three decades or so, um, and this is my first stint working embedded in an archive and I'm really enjoying it, learning lots. Um, so tonight what I thought I'd cover in the 15 minutes is just a little bit about uh, the National Archives collection, just to give some insights into the complexities of what it is we collect and what memory is about when you're collecting things in series and those sorts of things. Um, and we'll have a little bit of a shallow dive into, just to give her a bit of a flavour of that diversity of the collection. And then we'll talk a bit about our challenges um, and then talk about funding and what we're planning and of course all that recent media um, that's been going on around uh, the National Archives. Um, it's, I should say, it's fundamentally a story of hope though, a new hope. Um, so, purpose. Uh, a very worthy statement we have here, um, but what we, what the National Archives is about really is about connecting people um, with the evidence of Australian government activities and decisions. And, and that is about strengthening our identity and of course our democratic traditions. As I say, it's a very, it's a very worthy purpose, a very important purpose. If we talked about mission, then we would be talking much more about how we do those connections in a digital sense in the, in the contemporary, um, contemporary world. Um, so quick, quick uh, little bit of a look at our collection. And I'm going to fire these stats off and um, something, something, I'm not going to test you, it's okay, but I'll come back to these stats and just how these get used in terms of how, how we convince or otherwise government in terms of our funding requirements. So as it says, we've got over 40 million items in the collection, 40 million, um, so that's again 40 million. Um, and just to make the point, just to pause on that, when we talk about items, we also talk about records. Um, and if you think about a record being a file, within a file, there'll be folios. So in fact, if we say roughly 20 million items are uh, paper files, and there's an average 40 folios in those files, there's actually about 800 million separate items there. It's just, and the numbers just get big and scary. Um, we've digitized about 7.5%. Um, you can also see there we've got over 22 million photographic items. Nitrate negatives, acetate negatives, prints, um, transparencies, positives, all sorts of things. We've, we digitise around about 18% of those. 200,000 containers of motion picture film. That's a small collection of nitrate film, a bit unstable there, uh, but the bulk of it is acetate film. Um, 270,000 magnetic tape, uh, audio visual items, and we've done a little bit better there in terms of our digitisation uh, at about 45%. And then that last data, I think that uh, that is wrong. Um, I think I saw a couple of um, archives people on this chat. They can probably correct that figure. Um, but let's say three and a half, four petabytes of data currently in our digital archive, and that's growing and it's growing fast. <clears throat> but what does the collection look like? So we can do some audience interaction here if we like. Um, anyone has a guess at well, not what these are. But who these were, perhaps? Anyone, anyone want to have a guess? Go for it. Got, an, got our soldiers. We've got Menzies. You're getting warm. You're getting warm. Prime ministers, you're on the right. Libera. <laughs> Gee. Um, not quite. No, in fact, they actually belong to. I can share, just click this man here, Harold Holt. Um, and they are in our collection. They are, in fact, uh, the sleeping mask of Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, the late, very late, um, Harold Holt. And uh, you can see on the left his uh, briefcase. They were contained in that briefcase, along with other things, such as a Vicks inhaler and some pills and papers, as an example, example of some of the papers in that case, in that briefcase. Um, and they, that case was on, on the, uh, in his car, basically, at Sherbet Beach, February 1967, when he tragically 
went missing, presumed drowned. Um, so, you know, it's not just about paper in when we think about archives collections. The photographs of Zara and, and Harold there, that's also in our collection, from our photographic collection. The, um, the, I'm happy to share these images afterwards. Um, in, the, in the interest of time, I won't read that note, but it's basically a bit of a, bit of a tongue in cheek um, at Holt about appointments to Privy Council. Um, and uh, interesting, interesting the sort of, it gives an insight into the sort of things that were going on in Holt's you know, immediate life and space and work. And also, again, it's about how you construct, what is the memory that's constructed around those records? We have colonial records in our collection. Um, this is, in fact, the uh, a title transfer signed by uh, Governor King on the 1st of May, 1804. I think it's, if, if not the, it's certainly in amongst the oldest of the records uh, in our collection. Um, and this related to the movement of, or transfer of title of a body of um, piece of land in Pitts Lane, later to become Pitt Street in Sydney. Um, and that site was ultimately the extension to the GPO, to the post office in, in CBD Sydney. So that title document then became a Commonwealth record as, as the Postal Service was a, was a Commonwealth uh, service that was delivered. Um, we have lots of these military service records. Uh, this, there's about a million of these. These are World War II service records. Um, and this particular record out of interest for Leslie John Smith, um, is in fact the grandfather, or the maternal grandfather of our current Prime Minister. Um, but, and we currently have a project digitising these records. But interestingly, because of resource constraints, we can only digitise the paper. We're not digitising the photographic uh, records beyond quick scan, which is what you see on this, um, on this service record here. Uh, interesting point here, the uh, officer who signed the, uh, the attestation form was Lieutenant Turnbull. Interesting. Uh, we also have, uh, what I've just talked about is very Eurocentric collecting. We also have in our collections some extremely significant records relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and nations. And a lot of those collections uh, relate to things like evidence given as part of uh, Royal Commissions, um, Aboriginal Land Commission hearings, Native Title hearings, and a lot of them are evidence given in language on country and sit on fairly unstable um, formats such as audio cassette uh, in some cases. So there's a lot of, you know, in terms of constructing memory, there's a lot of issues around cultural sensitivity around what memories are held. I mean, some of these languages may not, you know, they may actually not be spoken anymore. So that, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very complex um, space in terms of record keeping as it relates to the Commonwealth. So you're getting a sense of some of the challenges from, you know, that sort of shallow dive into the into our collection. Um, and I think it's it's this view that was put forward from Gideon Haig recently in one of his articles, you know, talking about archives, paradoxically forward-looking institutions, creation gestures to confidence in a country's future, that there will be great things worth recording and bad things worth pondering, even if initially they may be difficult to distinguish. You know, and that, that really is that space about, you know, we collect and we collect records. We don't know what the future memory may be, but the importance of collecting those records and having that collection there cannot be understated. And so in terms of the actual challenges we face, um, you know, we're talking such big numbers. So which records at risk do we prioritise? If we're talking about millions of items, how do we prioritise those? We've got to digitise, but with such large numbers, we've got to digitise at scale. We've got to do it en masse. So how do we do that? Um, what do we need to change or to do to provide access to those records in a digital context? And what's the public interest? And I guess that that last point, you know, has played out recently in terms of, uh, as Matt alluded to, in terms of the, the media interest around um, the funding situation for the National Archives and the challenges we face in, in exactly this space in trying to determine, you know, which records we keep, how do we do it, how do we tackle it, um, and how do we tackle it in a constrained funding environment, we say. 
So, you know, I think as we all know, recently on the 1st of July, very pleasingly, the government then made a $67.7 million announcement regarding funding for the National Archives for the next four years um, and allowing us to start to tackle some of those challenges. So what will, be, what will we be tackling? So we will, um, with thanks to Bob Hawke and Norman Gunston here, we will um, be able to digitise all our at-risk magnetic tape uh, records, uh, audiovisual records. So everything under what's known as the deadline 2025 banner. So did the 2025 is the date identified by UNESCO that you know is off the cliff kind of date when due to technical obsolescence or deterioration of format, it'll be too late to save and digitize those records on magnetic tape. So that's a big, that is a big significant step in terms of that, that funding. It'll allow us to build our digitization capability in-house and it'll allow us to scale up using outsourced digitization providers as well. So we can move into that en masse digitization of not just our audio visual records, but also some of our paper and photographic records as well. Uh, it'll allow us to have a cyber secure digital archive. We have one already, but this is about evolving it into a much more um, you know, usable and accessible uh, space. So, you know, we're very much about preserving, digitizing and preserving, but this is also about thinking about the access side of the question. It'll allow us to actually start to engage uh, with our other Commonwealth agencies in terms of helping them from their information management requirements in terms of, you know, we're now talking about digital record keeping as well as physical and analog record, record keeping. And it will significantly improve our capability to undertake access examination and clearance of records. We have some large backlogs there, so this will help us, and, you know, and we've, we've copped quite a bit of flack over those backlogs. Um, this will help us significantly get stuck into some of those backlogs. So the $67 million question, what is the $67 million question? I guess there's a lot of $67 million questions in there. Um, but the one that I just wanted to briefly reflect on um, is how, how do we secure the funding? Now, I guess, you know, there was a lot of noise in the, in the press. There was great support from the public. You know, our membership program, which we kicked off at the end of last year, now has over, I think we're up to 900 members in our membership program. $150,000 worth of donations from the public um, and great support from the media, great support from the academy um, and that, you know, great bipartisan support. But it's a big difference. We've been talking about this for a long time, for at least 10 years. We've been, we've been putting all those stats out, those stats I showed at the beginning of the session. Um, you know, we've been talking in numbers, in big numbers, in hours, in all those sorts of things. But this time around, the big difference is we personalised it. We selected, so, so earlier this year, in January this year, we identified, we tried to have a top 20, we couldn't get it to 20, we had a top 50 in the end. Top 50 records or series of records that we thought, you know, if the message around the loss of these, um, this is what's gonna drive people to engage. And then ultimately, in terms of funders, to engage as well. Um, the Pit Can Register seemed to get a lot of, a lot of traction, interestingly. Um, and, and, if, and if you believe the press, apparently Prince Charles was even engaged in this space, in this space. But it really was about personalising the records. Rather than talking in, just chunking it up in terms of big numbers and, and taking that approach, by being quite selective about the records we chose, whether they're records of prime ministers, everyday records, immigration records, service records, um, pick in registers, you know, registers of birth, yes, marriages of the of the Christian families, you can see there, quite a few of them there. Um, that personalization really was what enabled supporters and advocates to really latch on and then help persuade and influence and advocate on our behalf. And I guess in the, in the words of Justice Michael Kirby, you know, we, we held a mirror up to the people of Australia. This was really just saying, this is, these are the records. These are the people we see in the records. This is us. This is important. And through that, we, we secured that. Um, that was the how of, of securing that funding with the support of quite a, um, quite a, quite a reasonable um, round table of cabinet that, that supported the funding of the National Archives. So that's, uh, that was very pleasing. 
Uh, my time is up and on that note, I will say thank you very much. Look forward to the questions.